Thank you. May be seated. Okay. Y'all know what this is? Get it out and blow. Blow. Get it all out of your head. Don't be sniffing while we're preaching, okay? Get it all out. There you go. All right. This morning, I'm going to read to you a short excerpt from the book we talked about last week, we read from. And then we're going to talk about a subject that has caused a lot of division in Christianity, a lot of misconception, a lot of confusion, and I hope that after presenting it today, you will understand the true nature of it. Because most of the time, what happens is, people reject a false concept of this topic and don't realize that the true nature of this is not bad, it's good, but what they're rejecting is a misrepresentation. And that happens in so many doctrines. People reject the Trinity because after all, we don't believe in three gods. No, we don't believe in three gods. Don't reject the Trinity on that ground, okay? Uh, and there's many others like that. We're going to talk about the Christian Patriot and where that fits in our faith and does it fit in our faith. Uh, from the book uh, Torture for Christ, Richard Wormbrandt. A pastor by the name of Forescu was tortured with red-hot iron, pokers, and with knives. He was beaten very badly. Then starving rats were driven into his cell through a large pipe. He could not sleep, but had to defend himself all the time. If he rested a moment, the rats would attack him. He was forced to stand for two weeks, day and night. The communists wished to compel him to betray his brethren, but he resisted steadfastly. In the end, they brought his 14-year-old son and began to whip the boy in front of his father, saying that they would continue to beat him until the pastor said what they wished him to say. The poor man was half mad. He bore it as long as he could. Then he could not stand it anymore. He cried to his son, Alexander, I must say what they want. I cannot bear your beating anymore. The son answered, Father, don't do to me the injustice to have a traitor as a parent. Withstand. If they kill me, I will die with the words, Jesus and the fatherland. The communists, enraged, fell upon the child and beat him to death with blood splattered over the walls of the cell. He died praising God. Our dear brother Florescu was never the same after seeing this. <clears throat> Jesus and the fatherland. What does that mean? Jesus and the fatherland. Was there a, a problem with that? Was there a mix-up with that? What was the issue? Well, let me read you what else is said here. Moses Hess, one who had a lot of influence on Karl Marx, Hess, taught, uh, Hess had taught Marx that socialism was inseparable from internationalism. That's not like a word you know today. What word do we hear a lot about? Globalism. Okay? Same thing. Marx writes in his Communist Manifesto that the prolet proletariat, which is the working class, has no fatherland. In his Red Catechism, Hess mocks the fatherland notion of the Germans. And he would have done the same with the fatherland notion of any European nation. So this idea of the fatherland is directly against the communist ideas for internationalism or globalism, okay? Now, in the same book, he says, patriotism is a virtue if it means the endeavor to promote economically, politically, spiritually, and religiously the welfare of one's own nation, provided that it is done in friendship and cooperation with other nations, okay? So there's one... Uh, definition of patriotism patriotism versus globalism globalism ends up being elitism destroy the landowners and the middle class and of course christianity so the elite can enslave the world which is what happens in socialist nations um, patriotism is not just american you can be a russian patriot a jewish patriot a chinese patriot okay um, it's one who loves and supports his or her country. 
Oh, yeah, but we, our citizenship is in heaven. We shouldn't have those feelings, blah, blah, blah. Is that true? Is it true that if I say I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If I say that, is that idolatry? Is that okay? Is it wrong? Well, we're going to talk about it. Let's talk about it. The word patriot comes from the Greek patriotes, from patrios of one's fathers, or from patris, fatherland. Okay? In the Bible, we find Paul saying, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. He says again, and it came to pass, after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner. He says in Romans 11, 28, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the fathers' sakes. God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of your fathers. Acts 3, 3, 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. What does the fathers have to do with it? This is the word patrio, petrus, of fathers. It's the word where we get patriot. So what is a true Christian patriot? A true Christian patriot is a grateful son. Okay? It's not some Harley Davidson rider with a, a red, white, and blue bandana and uh, something like that, you know, going down the, the highway. That's not a true patriot. A true patriot is a grateful son. Now, let's talk about that. It's also a good steward of what the fathers have passed to us. Not just my particular father. When the Jews talked about the fathers, they meant all the leaders before them who had passed down something worth having, something worth saving, something good had been passed down. They didn't, they didn't start out at zero when they were born. There was something that was passed to them that gave them the opportunities for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that they enjoy. And if they're a grateful son, they will honor it and appreciate it and appreciate the labors of those before them. And they will try to uphold that which is good and right of what was passed to them from the fathers. That is true Christian patriotism. Gratefulness. A good steward. <coughs> the prodigal son was an ungrateful son. He was not patriotic in the true sense of the word. Okay? He didn't desire to preserve the family cause or the national cause. He wasted the inheritance. He allowed the labors of his father and his grandfather and whoever had passed this down to him, whatever he was receiving, he allowed it to be wasted by the ungodly. Because he did not continue the family cause and build upon his inheritance, he ended up starving and eating with the swine in another land with no rights or privileges. That is prophetic. We're not talking about, I'm just a flag-waving American nut. We're not talking about that. But we, of all people, we Christians of all people, should show Americans how to be grateful sons. With proper honor, respect, and care for the fatherland. Our country. What we have. What our fathers have given to us. And proper gratitude for the inheritance we have received from our forefathers. We have a nation with decent laws and decent government. We have a constitution that surpasses every country on earth. We have a wonderful Christian liberties passed to us from our forefathers. We have law and order without the injustice and oppression of many other countries. You don't realize what you've got unless you've lived in other countries. Or read about it. Or learned about it. What we have in America is why people want to come here. Other countries build walls to, peop to keep their people in. We need to build one to keep people out. <coughs> who need to come in legally. Not because we're heartless. They need to come in properly and legally. Okay? That's what laws are for. If they don't respect our laws, then 
Who says they're going to respect him once they get here? Okay? People need to respect the rule of law in every category. Okay. The Jews, when they were carried to Babylon, Psalm 137.1, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave unto the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Was that right? Didn't God send the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem? Shouldn't they hate Jerusalem? No. No. There was a lot of, of beauty, a lot of good in the idea that they had of Jerusalem. Just because wicked rulers had tried to destroy that and God was judging them. Jerusalem to them was the, the fatherland of all of our forefathers back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who lived in, in the, the hills of Judea. Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem at that time. Whatever there was of Jerusalem at that time and, and Abraham paid tithes to him. This goes way back. And so now they're in a strange land. Now, all that their fathers had given them, all that their fathers had passed down to them, a land where they uh, had privileges and rights and a government of their own people was taken away. Now, all the government is some other people speaking some other language. You don't care about me or my children or my grandchildren. They don't care about me. Back at home, the government was my own people. That was a good thing. In fact, God said, don't put anybody in charge who's not native born, who's not one of you, for that very reason. It's a beautiful thing when fathers can pass down a heritage to their children, and children can live in peace and prosperity with a government that's good because the fathers forethought and work and labor. You say, yeah, that was right, because God gave them the land, and expected them to be grateful and good stewards of God's gifts. But what about us? We're not living in Israel. You know, <clears throat> Jacob, Jacob had purchased, or Abraham had purchased a section of land from the sons of Hess to marry the cave of Machpelah and the field and so forth there around Mamre. And Jacob was received that. Evidently, the Amorites at one point took it away. From what we understand, and in Genesis 48, 22, moreover, uh, he's saying to Joseph, moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. He bought it and then defended and recovered it from the Amorites. John 4, 5 says, and Jesus cometh to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. This was the one that he fought for with his sword and his bow and took it back out of the hand of the Amorite. It was his inheritance. He was going to give it to Joseph. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward, and command, and command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir. And they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed to yourself, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a footbreadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for possession. So were they supposed to be patriotic for Mount Seir? God gave it to them. Were they supposed to preserve it and keep it and defend it? Sure they were. That's what, that was their children's inheritance. <coughs> you shall buy meat of them for money that, that they, uh, ye may eat, and ye shall also buy water of them for money that ye may drink. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these forty years, the Lord thy God hath been with thee, thou hast lacked nothing. And when we passed by from our brethren the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, 
<coughs> through the way of the plain from Elath and from Ezi and Geber, we turn and pass by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for possession. The Emim dwelt therein in time past, a great a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them, when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of their possession, which the Lord gave unto them. So, okay, God gave, uh, you know, uh, Moab and Ammon were children of Lot. God gave the Moabites Ar, and he gave the children of Esau Seir. That was their land. Okay? Um, <coughs> what have we received? God allows people to obtain and hold land and pass it on to their children. That was part of the operations all over the world. You look at the history of mankind moving from place to place and obtaining different places. And they want to secure it for their posterity. We are to be grateful and good stewards to hold what God has given and try to keep it free from wickedness. When we pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're supposed to work for that, not just pray it. We're supposed to work at it in the fatherland, in our land, where God has given us to live. What God has passed to us, we are to be good stewards. In 1 Timothy 2, 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That includes the leaders. Okay? Now, Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him what to teach. So, Timothy goes into a foreign land, and these people, this is their fatherland, this is the land that was passed to them from their fathers. What's he supposed to teach them? He's supposed to teach them to pray and supplicate for their leaders... For all that are in authority, they're supposed to try and influence their nation for godliness. They're supposed to try and be salt and light in that nation. Just like when Paul talked to Festus and Agrippa. Just like when Jesus uh, talked to the, the one in authority when he was alive. Just like John the Baptist talked to Herod. Just like um, uh, Peter and James and John talked to the Sanhedrin. Okay? They're supposed to try and influence government in godliness. That we, the people of God, might live in peace and godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Because this aids in the development of Christian teaching and training. Aids in, in the development of churches and evangelism and missionary work. When God's people have peace and calm. Mm -hmm. Now... It's true that persecution can be a cleansing of the church. But you go talk to and uh, read what Richard Wormbrand says and talk to those people who came out of there and see how much Christian activity they could actually do. It was minimal. It was secret. It was underground. It was continually persecuted. Uh, millions of people being killed and bloodshed over Russia, China, Romania when the communists came to power. It was said in his book, six million in Russia when the communists came to power. Another six million in China when the communists came to power. Okay? That is not conducive for the propagation of the gospel. Those people cannot be evangelized anymore. <coughs> when citizens become Christians, they do not cease to be citizens with obligations of gratitude and stewardship in their country. Grateful sons of the fathers who established the nation. Carrying on the good concepts that they had. Protecting godliness. Protecting the good. Requires that we encourage good laws and good government. It, it also requires that we convert and baptize leaders. That's what Paul did. That's what Jesus did. That's what John did. That's what all the apostles did. Uh, tell them when they're violating God's law. It is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. They're violating God's law. Give counsel concerning legal. Uh, is, it, is it legal for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Uh, I don't think we should take this voyage. 
It'll be a, with much loss. This is Paul talking to the centurion. Continually, all through the Bible, the apostles are giving counsel to those in leadership for the sake of promoting godliness in the country. Abraham did that when he delivered Lot. Jacob defended his own land. Joseph, what did, why did Joseph, why did God give Pharaoh a dream that only Joseph could interpret? Do you think he wanted his people influencing government? Of course he did. Nathan the prophet, Elijah, Elisha, Abijah. Look at Daniel. God installed Daniel. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael in the government. Daniel 4.27 Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel counseling the government. Daniel 6.2 And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give a counsel to them, and the king should have no damage. Daniel was put in the top of the counselors, so the king would receive no damage. Now, what does that tell you about Daniel? Daniel, though he's in a foreign land, had learned a lesson. Whatever land you find yourself in, promote the good and the godliness of that land. Right. Is that scriptural? Yeah. Jeremiah actually wrote to them and told them to do so. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 7. God says, Seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Okay? So Daniel's doing that. Daniel 6, 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could not find occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful. And in all true sense of the word, he was a patriot. He was a grateful son. Even in Babylon, he was grateful for law and order and the government that was there. The powers that be are ordained of God, okay? And whoso resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. Daniel believed that. And he, while in Babylon, he wanted Babylon to be in peace. While in Babylon, he wanted Babylon to have good government. While in Babylon, he wanted God's blessing on the nation. He was a true grateful son in Babylon. <clears throat> and the king saw that, put him at the top. Joseph did that in Egypt. A true faithful son in, in that category, under that government. <clears throat> But they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So, yeah, I'm serving the government. I'm promoting the good of the government. But I'm not compromising the law of my God. Daniel, what an example. What an example he is. Yes, he's a faithful son, even in a foreign land. A true patriot, seeking the peace and prosperity and economic good of that land. Mm -hmm. But he's a Christian patriot. Look at Ezra and Nehemiah. They were working under the king of Persia. And God was working through them. Nehemiah 2.3 uh, Nehemiah said unto the king, Let the king live forever. The king said, Why are you sad? He was afraid. He said, I've never been sad in his presence before. But he said, Let the king live forever. Daniel said that to a number of kings. O king, live forever. That was a proper response. Sounds kind of patriotic, doesn't it? Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? A faithful son in Persia. But he had concern. He had love for the fatherland where his forefathers lived. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. What is the next book? Esther. Esther. Read Esther if you want to know how Christians and government should get along. Mordecai saves the king's life. They side with the government where it's good. Okay? They protect it. They, they are patriotic where it's right. He saves the king's life. And then when someone rises up in government with, that is wicked, because of their track record of being good patriots, because of their track record of being good under government and supporting good government, that very incident saves them when bad government rises up. That's the, that's the word of God on the subject. God can use a good relationship 
they had previously with the government. Well, Daniel, Daniel's memory was still alive in Mordecai's day. Okay? <clears throat> they even took up arms and helped the government expel the wicked and defend themselves. 1 Timothy 6.1 Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. Okay, by you honoring your masters, your earthly masters, whether they're saved or unsaved, by you showing proper respect and honor, proper support in godly things, you keep the word of God and His doctrine from being blasphemed. 1 Peter 2.13 Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Obviously, you can't submit yourself to bad ordinances for the Lord's sake. But you can support everything that is good and right in those ordinances, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing he may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, well, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of heaven, yeah, I'm free, but not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. I am an agent of God in this country, under this government. I am God's agent. And my proper response, where God has put me, is a patriotic, supportive, grateful response to the fathers. <clears throat> honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Ephesians 6, 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. That's government, employer, anybody who's over you. With fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, what is included in that? All good government actions. All good government. Everything God has ordained the government to do, you can do. Whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive the Lord, whether he be bond or free. <clears throat> Romans 13, 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. General rule. Okay? Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. <clears throat> for for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. What very thing? Bearing the sword, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Uh, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Okay, that means love that fulfills God's law through Moses is perfectly in, in agreement with what he just said about government. Okay, which we know, read the Old Testament. Paul saw love in God's law as consistent with supporting government. Matthew 22, 17. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought it unto him, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Yeah, that's, that's appropriate. In the same chapter, Matthew 22, 36, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
In the same chapter, he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Well, doesn't that include loving my neighbor? Yeah. Love, love gives proper respect and honor to the ruling powers. Like Daniel did. Daniel is a great example. He was faithful, except if there was a conflict with the law of his God. Mm -hmm. He was willing to die then. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were faithful. They were put in high positions. They were doing much good. But they didn't compromise righteousness. They didn't compromise the faith. Great examples they are. Put in the Word of God for that very reason. Now, let me read to you some portions of the Declaration of Independence. These are just excerpts. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of govern government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organi or organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evil, evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And they list a long list of grievances. Then they say, In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may be defined, which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are of a right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the british crown and that all political connection between them and the state of great britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war conclude peace contract alliances establish commerce and to do all other acts and things which independent states may have right do. And for, the per and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. And they all signed it. <clears throat> Are you a grateful son? When the persecuted Christians wanted somewhere to go, where'd they go? Christians all over Europe being persecuted need somewhere to go. Where'd they go? Are you a grateful son? The preamble to the Constitution. By the way, those people didn't run to Britain. 
They came to America. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Are you a grateful son? Article 1, Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Are you a grateful son? Article 2, Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being ne necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. <coughs> Amendment 3. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Amendment 4. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects <coughs> against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. <clears throat> Are you a grateful son? Paul Cesar Hubmeyer, an Anabaptist minister who was burned at the stake for the faith of true Anabaptism, not the cause of pacifism, which was a, a, a departure and a sideline, he says, everyone should be subject to the government, believing or unbelieving. We should be obedient and subject to it. For there is no government which does not come from God. In other words, the powers that be. Okay? Therefore, obedience consists in all that which is not against God. For God has not ordered the government against himself. Now, if the government wants to punish the evil ones, as it should, for the sake of their soul's salvation, and is yet not strong enough to deal with the evil ones, then it is now to command its subjects through bells and various alarm signals, letters, or through other summons. Subjects are obligated, for the sake of the salvation of their souls, to sustain and help their superiors, so that the evil ones are annihilated and rooted out according to the will of God. Nevertheless, subjects should first test well the spirit of their governments, as to whether they are not moved and compelled more out of arrogance, rather than out of love of the common good and territorial peace. For that would not be to use the sword according to the order of God. However, <clears throat> if you recognize that the government punishes the evil only so that the righteous remain at rest and unharmed, then help, counsel, and sustain it as often and as much as you are commanded. Thereby you fulfill the order of God and do his work and not a human work. However, if a government is childish and foolish, yea, perchance it is not competent at all to reign, then you may escape from it legitimately and accept another, if it is good. For on account of an evil government, God has often punished an entire land. If the seeking of another cannot be done lawfully and peacefully, and not also without great damage and rebellion, then one must endure it as the one which God has given us in his wrath, and is, if he desires to chastise us on account of our sins, as those who deserve no better. Whoever now does not want to help the government save widows, orphans, and other oppressed ones, as well as to punish vandals and tyrants, Resist the order of God and will receive a judgment from him, for he acts against the mandate and order of God, who wants the righteous to be protected and the evil punished. However, if you are obedient, you should truly know that you are obedient not to the government or to people, but to God himself. And you have become a special servant of God, just as the government itself also is nothing other than a servant of God. However, Paul testifies openly that the government has the power and authority to kill the evil when he says... The authority does not bear the sword in vain. If now the government did not have the authority to kill, why should the sword then hang at its side? It would then bear it in vain, which Paul cannot bear. He also explicitly adds that the authority is the servant of God. Where are now those who say a Christian cannot use the sword? For if a Christian could not be a servant of God, could not fulfill the mandate of God without sinning, then God would not be good. He would have made an order which Christians could not fulfill without sin. That is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, I counsel you faithfully, dear brothers, return and repent 
You have stumbled badly and produced much trash everywhere against God and against brotherly love under the appearance of spirituality and the pretense of humility. God knows who I mean. Well said, Balthazar Hubmeyer. Are you a grateful son? This is one of your forefathers. Christians in every land should seek to honor and befriend their government. Christians in every land should seek to influence, teach, and lead their rulers to respect God's law and authority for the good of the nation. Christians in every land should support good government, justice, righteousness, and help their rulers protect the innocent and prosecute the criminals. This is part of loving our neighbors. Christians in every land should love God and love their neighbors according to God's word. Render to God the things that are God's and to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Christians in every land should pray for their government, seek to live peaceably with all men, and be the salt and light God expects them to be in their country. They should be model citizens who, like Daniel, is faithful in everything and only disobeys when it comes to compromising the law of God. All this is consistent with God's word and Christ's example. All of this is part of being a grateful son and a godly Christian. This is true Christian patriotism. A grateful son. Truly honoring our forefathers requires, though, choosing which fathers to honor. Truly honoring our forefathers requires choosing what aspect of our fathers to honor. In Joshua 24, 2, And Joshua said unto the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who's the Lord? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Abraham's father was an idolater. Okay? But Abraham wasn't. Which fathers are you going to follow is what Joshua was saying. Who, who are you going to choose for your fathers? Hezekiah was the son of wicked King Ahaz. But it says of Hezekiah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David, his father, did. David, his father? Ahaz was his father. No, he chose to follow Father David instead of Father Ahaz. Mm -hmm. Okay? He chose to honor the fathers that were righteous. Hezekiah's son Manasseh was wicked. Then his son Ammon was wicked. And then came Josiah. And it says of Josiah... Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. What about Hezekiah? What about Ammon? What about Manasseh? <clears throat> he was looking at David his father. Okay? Ezekiel 18, 14. Now, lo, talking about God's way of doing things. If he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like, but hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. Why? Because he chose to follow a father that was godly to follow. Okay? So we are to choose which fathers we claim as our forefathers. We are to choose what aspects of those fathers we are to claim. <coughs> Galatians 3, 7. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So what are you going to follow about Abraham? Josiah followed his father David. In what? Mm -hmm. Hezekiah followed his father David. In what? The godliness, the goodness, the righteousness, the good things that he did to that Hezekiah received a heritage. He did not start out at zero. He received something to build upon. And he honored it. Okay? He followed it. <clears throat> Galatians 3.29 
And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed. I'm a son of Abraham. Oh, you're not a sinner. You're, you're a Japhethite. I'm a son of Abraham. Over and above all that, I'm a son of Abraham. We are to be good stewards of what our fathers have left, left us. This is the attitude of the Christian patriot. The Daniel. The Nehemiah. The Joseph. A true son of of the fathers, an appreciative son, a grateful son, the kind of son that the forefathers, when they were fighting, when they were establishing, trying to get something that was good, trying to get something that would be free of tyranny, trying to get something that would be productive for their posterity. I want to be the son that they looked down and saw somebody upholding the godliness of it, somebody living it, somebody standing up for truth so that the posterity could continue in peace and safety and righteousness. That's the patriot. If you want to be a Marxist patriot, then you're honoring them as your fathers. You're still a patriot. But see, the difference between Marxism is they're globalists. Internationalism. They hate nationalism. And the word nationalism simply means caring for my nation. Okay? You can add, you can add it to different things. All right? But if I am caring for my nation, my country, this is my country. My fathers fought for this country. My fathers gave the government. I have been blessed by growing up in this country. It's my country. Do I appreciate it? Am I grateful for it? Am I grateful for what, it, what George Washington did, what Abraham Lincoln did? Well, am I grateful for these men? Yes. Yes, just like Hezekiah was grateful for David. I don't agree with everything Abraham did. I don't agree with everything David did. I'm thankful for the heritage of what I can glean, the good that I can glean from them. That's right. Okay? That's true Christian patriotism. Something that prodigal son really needed. He didn't give a care about the future of his posterity. He took, he took what his fathers had given to him. Grandfather and father. The family farm. The inheritance. He took what he did and went out into a foreign land and blew it. No inheritance for his children. There is blessing in multi-generational faithfulness. There is blessing when people care about their nation. And they work to produce godliness for the posterity. This is why the true Christian who understands things, his heart is touched when he hears the national anthem. It has nothing to do with the present political nitwits that are here and there. It has to do with the overall cause, why this nation was established, what it was meant to be, and what we have received from those who landed in Plymouth. What we have received from those who fought in the, the war of, of uh, independence. <clears throat> what we received from people who stood up for right all along the way. <clears throat> oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. For purple mountain majesty above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed His grace on thee. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O beautiful for pilgrim's feet whose stern impassioned stress. A thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. O beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, by an alabaster city's gleam, undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed His grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood 
from sea to shining sea. I can say amen to that. I can pray for my land. I can pray that God, that all success would be nobleness and every gain divine. That our liberty would be tempered by law. I can say amen to all that. I am thankful. I am thankful for where I live. I am thankful for my heritage. I don't want to reconstruct my history. I can see the flaws and the good points of my nation, but I can see that it has been the best place on the planet for Christians to thrive in the history of the world, probably. And we need to try and keep it that way. Right. More missionaries have gone out of these United States to the world than any other nation. More tracts, more help, okay? More Christian influence. Now, I know there's been a lot of ungodliness, but show me a nation where more <coughs> Christian teaching, books, and help, and missionary work, helping the poor. Show me a nation who's given more than America. I don't have to be proud of the wickedness. And I can help, I can help get Haman out of the way. I can help to get Haman hung. Okay? By being friends with the king. That's my part. To be the Mordecai. To do the Esther part, okay? I'm not going to be the anti-American burn the flag idiot. That's not my place. I'm a grateful son. I appreciate what's been handed to me. And I want to help it. I want to encourage it in the right way. Let's stand together. That's what a Christian patriot is. Any thoughts before we pray? You mentioned globalism. And globalism versus nationalism, I would be hard put to, to come up with an argument one way or the other. But I have a Bible, and I can read what it was like before the Tower of Babel. And I can see what God thought of it. And I can see what God did about it. Even though He knew the heartache, misery, um, fighting that was going to result from it. Right. And I can look at globalism and say, it's a bad idea. Right. You know, we don't have to understand all the political schemes and strategies. But if you understand God's Word and how God works and what God would do in this situation... It will guide you, too. you remember last week we talked about the communist omelet? That's why they're globalists. They want every egg cracked. They don't want individualism. They don't want nationalism. They want elitism. Is what they want. In their own writings. In their own writings. They want a, an elite group to control the world and everybody else lose their individualism and be basically be slaves. And I, I think they also know that a Christian society will be far more powerful than a communist society. So as they allow a Christian nation to thrive beside a communist nation, it's not going to work. Right. We have to take out the Christian nation. It's going to have to be global, but it's not going to work. It's hard to understand unless you understand that Satanism is at the top. And getting rid of Christians is the main goal. When you understand that, it all makes sense. There's a lot about what communists have done. That if you divorce communism from Satanism, it doesn't make sense. But when you understand that all the communist founders were also Satanists and hated God and hated Christians, okay? then it makes sense what they have actually done. Not so much what they say, but what they do. So, yeah. Nash, God, God did the Tower of Babel to protect what? To protect the faithful. To protect the godly. Because if the wicked, the wicked glue together more quickly. They stand together because they have a common enemy, God. And they would easily dominate the planet and Christianity and righteousness would be wiped out. You want me to prove it? Look at the flood. Eight people. 
Eight people were all that was left. So who is dominating the planet? The ungodly, okay? So, in order to avoid those types of things, uh, you have different nations. Therefore, godly people can migrate to a certain place and have a godly nation, and that can protect them from the domination of the ungodly. And uh, the devil knows it. Yeah, I think it's very important to understand. We've we talked to people in the past who say, well, there's no way I can vote for that person because of their personal life. And you have to understand that there are, it's our God-given responsibility to vote for the, quote, lesser of two evils. Or the, the platform the pl of the lesser right. of two evils. Right. So if you, that's why God, we will ultimately be judged on Judgment Day. We can't vote one way and support a wicked platform and say, well, God, this is my ethics and this is what I really believed. He's going he's gonna to combine it all together. And say, no, you supported evil in your land when I put rulers in there and gave you responsibility to help elect those rulers, and you're supposed to support the lesser of the two evils. And that, that is, that's why it directly affects our salvation, how we are in our land, how, how our rulers are, and our responsibility to help affect that. The Spirit of God in us is going to push for the best the situation can allow at the time. Right. Okay, that's what Daniel did with Nebuchadnezzar. Right. Nebuchadnezzar was not a godly man. Right. Okay, uh, but he was pushing, trying to encourage Nebuchadnezzar in the right direction. Now, some people say, well, this guy, this so-and-so, he's uh, an adulterer. Okay, he's an adulterer, but he's upholding the Constitution. This guy over here is a treasonous, he's treasonous towards the Constitution. Okay. He is promoting the destruction of Christianity and the Constitution. Which is the worst of the sins? We need, to, we need to figure this out. Okay? And who's to say he's not an adulterer as well? But the thing is, we need to understand that treason is a sin against the whole nation. That man's adultery was a sin against his wife. Which is worse? Which, which is more apt to get hung? Well, they're both bad. Yeah. We're not defending any of it. Right. But would you rather have a president who's guilty of treason? Or one who will uphold the Constitution, but he had been unfaithful to his wife? Neither one of them is good, but there is a lesser of two evils, no doubt. And we need to realize that. One that's going to promote the murder of babies, and the other one who is going to be pro-life and try to steer the nation in a more pro-life way. You've got to take all that into consideration, right. because we will be held accountable for it. We will. And that's why, that's why it's such a sad thing to see all these conservative movements in our in this nation, they're taking advantage of what others have done to give them freedom. But they don't understand it is their duty to help rise up and uphold this, or we're gonna all lose it. And there's right. not gonna be a place on earth like America. There's no America to run to. No, and America is, America is in dire straits right now because socialism has never been closer to overtaking America than it is than it was before Trump got in. And what happens when he gets out? What happens when the pendulum swings? What happens then? Uh, it's very fearful to think of what could happen. And uh, I personally believe that all these idea of global warming and climate change are political cue words. They're political uh, uh, <coughs> code words because there was a big push. They all had they had it all planned out, and socialism was very close to being established in America. And, you know, there's a lot of things I believe about this. I think it's, it's obvious to anybody who has their eyes open as to why the Democrats want an open border and all these illegals to come in and vote. Okay? They're going to, they know that democracy or, or a true republic is destroyed when people begin to vote <coughs> blessings to themselves out of the public treasury. Okay? They will bankrupt the nation. They're going to vote for those who give to them, they're going to vote for those who hand out regardless of the, the long-term sustainability of it all. Did we hear that Congress is about to vote another pay raise? And that's another issue. Um, so, yeah, we need to be careful. We need to be careful. There, there are a lot of people who do not have our posterity in their hearts and minds. Yeah, I think on the topic of you know, qualifications for leadership, the Bible, there's many, many realms of leadership that God has ordained, it's all delegated. And 
he gives qualifications for what what he believes should be there, and, and there's qualifications for each role, and they're not all the same. Uh, you're going to have to live to a much stricter standard to be the minister, a deacon, a bishop in a church. There's going to be certain standards that you're going to need to live to, to to keep God's blessing as you'd be the man of your house. And the same goes with the government. And so while we're, we're saying, you know, the lesser of two evil business, whether in God's sight that man's soul is more endangered by one than the other is not really for us to judge or decide. But rather, what qualifies him for that office or disqualifies him for that office? And, and, and that goes for every realm of office and every realm of delegated authority. Okay, so does, you know, a, a, a bad attitude or a someone who's, you know, someone who's a, a mishandler of money or something like that might disqualify them from being a job foreman because they won't be able to operate efficiently or appropriately. It won't work. That business will crash. Doesn't mean they can't be something else. And so I would say the same goes with the government. When you're, we're talking, when you say the lesser of evil, it's this one, they're both evil, this one disqualifies you from this position because it directly affects your effectiveness in this position and ability to do the job you're trying to fill. This other one is evil, and you'll give account to God for it, and it'll send you to hell just like the other one will, and God will make those determinations. You're still violating God's law blatantly, but this other one does not directly um, disqualify you from being able to fill this position appropriately. Yeah, and, and the so, thing is this, like, along with that is, what will they do in the position? What are they going to do in the position? Uh, that's what voting has to consider first and foremost. What are they going to do in the position? Um, they, they swear to defend the Constitution, but it, are they? Will they? That's what we've got to that's what we've got to determine. Um, these are things that the Christian should be very concerned about. Churches who say, oh, we can't be involved in politics. Okay. Most of those people came from a country where they were kicked out. Because they were driven out because of their faith. They, they fled. Where did they go? Why did they have a place to go to? It wasn't because of people like them. It was because of other people who believed in partaking in government that they had a place to flee to. They need to remember that. Okay? They need to remember and be grateful sons as well. Let's pray.